Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. I'm a fish biologist, ichthyologist and also a PhD student specialising and studying the evolution of Laura Card's catfishes which are also known in the hobby as plecos. So today I'm going to kind of continue my um, sort of episodes on a bit of freshwater biology and just to understand the background of fish keeping, what I talk about and the environment that the fishes live in because I think that's really important. Remember that I'm only going into sort of the basics of a topic and idea of something to research further and if you want to research as many resources you can do so. It, they're not really mentioned so much in the Chrome Hobby so you'll be looking mostly at ecology and stuff like that. People do spend their entire career studying even the niche parts of this topic so remember it there is a lot more to it and it's not always as simple as it looks. A good textbook if you want um, something just to start off with is this I recommend. So this is um, The Ecology of Freshwaters, A View for the 21st Century um, by Brian Moss. This is a really good book for con in context of um, living organisms within the environment so it's not just very raw hydrology so it can be really useful for fish keeping. Remember that a lot of studies into freshwater biology mostly cover um, the temperate zone so the northern hemisphere there's not as many studies on the tropics and specifically certain countries and maybe ecosystems are less studied than others. So what am I going to talk about today? Today I'm going to talk about nutrients and generally the three types of nutrients um, or nutrient levels within freshwater environments. And these are really important in the aquarium but never get mentioned um, or I've never seen them mentioned. So obviously there are sort of a lot more, there's a lot more complexity to it but I'm not going to go into cycling and the different sort of flow regimes or um, movement of nutrients within an environment that is a topic for another day because it gets a lot more complex especially when it comes to um, lakes I feel or water bodies that aren't so constant as rivers. So there's three types of different nutrient levels and obviously it's more of a spectrum maybe and there is a, um, a little bit more to it. So the three levels, you've got high nutrients which is known as oligotrophic, you've got sort of middle level nutrients which is known as mesotrophic and the um, low nutrients is oligotrophic. So what do you think that most water bodies or freshwater bodies are? And a lot of people will probably assume that they're mostly going to be eutrophic, full of nutrients because when people think of life they think it needs resources, it needs nutrients, um, it is full of different um, elements, compounds, minerals, organics, but actually a lot of freshwater ecosystems when you research them are oligotrophic, they're actually low nutrients and even in like terrestrial environments, rainforests which have the highest diversity um, are actually um, oligotrophic because they have very low nutrients, a lot of it is going to be captured within the organisms themselves in the terms of rainforest most likely um, and therefore it's going to be cycled very differently. In freshwater it's kind of different because there's different origins of this nutrients and it depends where you are in the river or in the lake and just because it's one lake it doesn't mean that it will have the same system within that one water body uh, that one water body can be kind of split up into multiples so what nutrients are we mostly looking at? We're mostly looking at nitrogen and phosphates or phosphorus. These are the ones that tend to create these sort of um, high nutrients, low nutrients and the difference in these environments. And obviously the major sources of these, there's many. Um, the biggest one is probably, I don't know, waste from organisms um, and that's one of the biggest issues is pollution and I'll talk about that later. So I've got my laptop here because I wrote a few notes um, and some of them are reasonably detailed I guess. Um, so all of these systems have good, bad and maybe a bit more complex um, 
situations to it because, well, that's how it is. In nature, obviously, as you have uh, other functions, as you travel down, nutrients does change and tend to increase, maybe decrease, maybe um, there's whole different elements of what people maybe ca classify as um, how this river changes anyway, how it flows. And nutrients will likely be trapped in certain regions of rivers, um, such as the lower reaches, more estuaries, that's more brackish, that's not our concern. Um, but also if you think of meanders, you might get nutrients sort of settling on the outside of a meander compared to the inside and you'll get different communities of organisms depending where you are in that. Streams, um, maybe the river is going through an area, maybe it's cutting through an area that's slowing down the flow or that part of the river, maybe it's certain tributaries, maybe it's the um, actual environment around the river. And just because it looks high nutrients doesn't always mean it is. Like the Rio Negro is actually um, oligotrophic low nutrients. So a lot of people maybe might, I'm going to really talk a little bit more into detail of the different ones. Um, cause it, because it's not really something that I can say this happens in this. Because there is a little bit more complexity to it. So a lot of people what kind of when they're wanting an aquarium they always think I want a lot of nutrients for my plants to grow and I think it's always worth recognizing about eutrophification it barely gets mentioned it barely gets thought about so eutrophification is the process that usually a mesotrophic low nutrients mesonutrients, nutrients uh, so oligotrophic mesotrophic becomes more highly um, has more nutrients than it would normally or the nutrients level increases and actually the higher the nutrients generally the oxygen saturation goes down and this is largely due to the increase in algal species who while they do photosynthesize the rate of photosynthesis does decrease on practically the actual uh, light dependent part um, doesn't occur at night and because they're always respiring the oxygen sort of consumption actually um, the oxygen consumption of the algae goes up the oxygen saturation of the water goes down and then also the algae will decay um, there's also probably a whole lot more um, microbes feeding on that excess nutrients who are also going to be taking up that oxygen decomposition does take oxygen there is um, anaerobic uh, anaerobic decomposition but also think that they're going to be releasing certain maybe um, gases compounds into where they are and also the rate of anaerobic decomposition compared to aerobic and how your tank is actually set up for either and the nutrients uh, yeah, so the nutrients is likely to encourage many different algal blooms um, or bacterial growths who themselves take up oxygen, so not so much. Algal blooms you do see, um, especially with high nutrients, high phosphorus potentially for um, sort of those algae that kind of, uh, what's it, like green water algae. The respiration from all of these organisms can decrease the pH. Um, by the production of uh, CO2 um, and use up your, um, if you believe, I don't know, that it can uh, relate to like carbonic acid and stuff like that. But also the production of other uh, waste products. And obviously it's not like it, it depends on how much nutrients, how much of these organisms you've got. There's a lot more to it obviously. It's not like you've got high nutrients it's a spectrum of nutrients and it depends on how much it's a lot more complex than just that and while this sounds truly great for aquatic plants the rate that algae can proliferate are much faster than plants and also it makes it difficult for the plants to outcompete the algae and other microbes there is some belief I guess or some people say that uh, algae use up different nutrients for plants they use up different parts of light spectrum but just remember the amount of diversity of algae there are 
um, and what you're fighting against, especially if you've got plants that are not adapted for or evolved for the fresh water environment and they're kept there, they're not at their best where they're going to compete as well. So you're managing that as um, that in addition. So these notes are just, they're not the best worded, um, but it gives an idea of the whole thing. And most aquariums probably won't be eutrophic. Uh, potentially, they, it depends. Eutroph and obviously, it kind of has a little bit of a, I guess there's no real, this amount of nitrogen and this amount of phosphorus mean eutrophic. It's more of a what was it and what is it now kind of situation and whether it's a lot more complex than and it's the same with salinity, uh, freshwater versus marine. It's not like this salinity it's now brackish and this salinity it's now salt water. So mesotrophic, the middle sort of range, it doesn't mean because it's the middle this is what you should aim for. Um, and while this sounds like the great solution and more natural in reality, it's a little bit more complex. Um, it's best to assume these waters are found in the lower reaches of a river, where nutrients and silt can settle. Whereas eutrophic is more of an unnatural state, this is maybe more natural in certain parts of the water. There's likely to be more alloctinous nutrients, so alloctinous is... Um, from external from the water, um, so external from the ecosystem, you get what I mean, but so external from the river or the lake. So, this is going to be, uh, say, leaves, uh, animal waste, um, soil, even just um, like the actual organisms themselves could be alloctinous, like um, in insect larvae that have then settled in the or developing in the river in the lake um, they're going to be adding in nutrients a lot of them some of them are evolved for um, clinging on to very high flow environments but others not and the nutrients isn't going to settle when they're releasing that anyway it tends to be where they the flow is weak enough for it to be able to sink to the bottom and a lot of people don't realise how strong a lot, a lot of the currents in fresh water actually are. Even your strongest um, aquarium or most people's strongest aquarium is going to be nothing on even the weakest river. Um, the issue here, here regarding nutrients is that while you might, um, while there might be higher, it, the nutrients might be high here as is the turbidity. It, the turbidity actually makes it more difficult for plants to grow. Um, so when you see freshwater environments, and it is in my book and I do have a video on it, you'll see that there's, it's too hot in upper reaches of the river, it's too fast flow, too little nutrients, um, plants can't settle because they're just going to get ripped off um, unless they can really cling on to those rocks, pebbles, stuff like that quite hard um, they're not there's no nutrients for them anyway it's quite a harsh environment but as you go down there's that zone where there's just enough nutrients uh, so stuff can start to settle it's not being shoved downstream quite quickly and then as you go a bit further down that turbidity so the actual clarity of the water decreases as a lot more nutrients um, or sediment um, is present and then the plants can't grow so well. So you generally see aquatic plants in quite a narrow range of like habitat styles for fresh water and there are plants that can deal with this. So potential plants that have evolved for these kind of turbid environments obviously when you think of them they actually evolve for quite low flow which makes sense because these environments are low flow, uh, low current. There are exceptions, obviously Rio Negro always um, is going to get a good name for that. Think about how many of those environments that are actually high turbidity, that turbidity is natural. Remember there's a lot of things that do kick up sediment, uh, carp are a big one. So potential plants have evolved for these habitats, Nymphia and um, Nymphoides, um, a lot of emergent uh, vegetation has evolved to be able to, because 
they're not going to be able to photosynthesize where there's no light so they're reaching out and even these could even deal with algae maybe a little bit better because they're not being blocked and that's a major issue of eutrophication where you do get algae blocking the amount of light actually penetrating through the water and that deep but these plants can actually get out of the water um, and photosynthesize there and that's more what they're adapted for than photosynthesizing under the water is this practical in the aquarium do you want a ball rush i would say or do you want a cypress in your aquarium maybe not and maybe some plants would struggle a lot more with this um uh with this than others well a lot of plants will struggle because they need that light there and it does depend on the plant uh, some plants need a lot more light obviously than others and different parts of the spectrum depending where they place naturally in the wild there's a lot more to plants than a lot of people think like um most of us don't keep true tree species inside i guess so they might be adapted to more dappled light in the um, in the wild and therefore also in captivity, um, captivity. but um, depends on the also spectrum because the spectrum of light will how much actually penetrates from all of the different light um, things um, it will depend where it is adapted to climbers are gonna and also I think it really affects how plants mature as well and depending how naturally you actually keep them whether they're in their more natural environment than to otherwise and whether they're in their optimum space so a lot of climbers I think are good. I love climbers because they're great to experiment with but when they're not actually climbing they tend to produce more juvenile leaves because I think the focus is to get somewhere get somewhere to climb to reach as much light as possible rather than producing those mature leaves that take longer to grow they take more energy more effort you just want to get something because there's no point putting more energy into something that's not going to get as much light as if you're going straight for that tree to grow up but i think they got house plants are great for explaining plant things anyway um so whereas many plants that were um Whereas many plants that struggle with low nutrients, um, uh, what I don't know why I've written that. Um, many plants do struggle with low turbidity. Um, so many plants are adapted for quite fast-flowing, low nutrients environments. Anyway, um, water crow's foot, or I think it's like white crow's foot, is a brilliant one where you see it a lot in chalk streams, particularly, um, which is quite low in the nutrients levels but it's got high flow rates, low turbidity, there's like, they're extremely clear water, so uh, genus, um, or species, ranunculus, aquaticulus, and they are quite adaptable, they have been seen in lower, they are found in lower flow environments, but it does actually change the morphology of the plant itself, um, which is quite interesting, I think you see it kind of in nymphaea, um, nymphoides, where when they're growing in a bit of a boggy environment they're a bit um, more clumpy um, they look a bit like hydrocotyl or what I visualise as hydrocotyl compared to nymph nymphoides when they're kept in a more aquatic environment where they look like almost a miniature water lily because they are related to nymphia anyway so other plants potentially have evolved for high um, nutrient environments such as bulrushes. You don't want a bulrush in the house, especially if it's flowering. You're going to get a lot of mess. When it comes to the tropics, I do not think many of these plants actually reach the market of high um, nutrient, high, um, high turbidity as a given for these environments often. Many of them don't reach the um, trade, I don't think. Obviously you've got... I guess some boggy exceptions where they're more house plants. Um, Dwarf cypress, I think, is adapted for more um, tropical range. Obviously, you've got the amazing Egyptian papyrus. That's quite big for the house, though, or the even the aquarium. It will take up most of the aquarium because a lot of these plants are quite vigorous growers and they are adapted maybe for a more niche environment. Uh, but a lot of people keep the sort of plants that a lot of people keep emergent aren't even emergent in the wild. 
that annoys me. I don't know why. <laughs> um, I just like to see plants be able to mature as well as they can, like, take that for, um, uh, monster, oh, so it's missold as Adesona, it's not Adesona, but look at that leaf compared to I Have God Juvenile, but it's miles away, like, they're like that if you grow them trailing, and they don't have as many holes or look quite as mature, they look almost a bit like, that um, but even smaller a sign of um, yeah a sign of plants that are adapted for um, high nutrients is probably that and therefore turbidity is that they're going to be emergent they're going to grow out of the water because they need that light um, and also those ones are probably the most beneficial as they if they decay they're not going to be putting that nutrients all the way back in you can almost chop off that vegetation but they're not the most practical they I think most of them are quite vigorous like even thinking like Equisetum um, Equisetum japonicum or japonica uh, the mare's tail I'm not sure what the scientific name is a lot of them are quite vigorous growers Lobelia a little bit um, and a lot of plants get put in a boggy environment when they're or pond when they're more bog plants. Um, I think gunneras they tend to grow best along the banks rather than in the river and they are vigorous um, growers. And it's not entirely due to nutrients why they grow like that, um, but or also turbidity in especially these sorts of plants, they tend to a lot of them tend to be quite nutrient demanding. Uh, just I guess by how vigorous they grow, they need that nutrients constantly. Um, hence why you buy a lot of fertilisers for water lilies and stuff. But a lot of fast flowing waters and low nutrients waters, these plants aren't going to get a foothold so easily. It's why there's such a narrow band almost, I guess, where there is plants and it kind of, sort of, what would it be? Like, it kind of is almost like a bell jar almost bell shaped curve of where you're going to get aquatic plants because there's going to be some higher up uh, like obviously um, bryophytes which can ad um, attach really easily uh, fishes we probably see in these um, environments, environments, um, environments um, are going to be those with more adaptations for maybe those lower oxygen levels as that tub, as the velocity of the water is decreasing and particularly some at the more extreme level there's good, not going to be that much and the high levels of potentially decomposition further reducing um, the oxygen saturation also the pH might be a bit more or the acidity might be a bit more um, challenging of these environments but particularly the oxygen and it depends where you are and if there's still good current like you see in maybe some of the major in sort of bits of the river and also depends on temperature temperatures massive oxygen saturation as I've explained many times I've got a video on temperature um, but the oxygen saturation you're going to really see a change in the adaptations of the fish there may be a lot more anabantoids um, as a good example because because um, at the time I was like I can't think of many but there's quite a few catfishes that have evolved to vacuatively air breathe and you even see it with fish that maybe are found at lower sort of slower flow waters um, but not enough that's going to cause massive issues of oxygen saturation. And there's not many plants like, but like Corydorus, you see, are able to vacuatively air breathe. Um, although it's obligate, I think, in a lot of anabantoids related. You've got Channa, Parachana, um, maybe even Polypterus. Lungfish are definitely adapted for these sort of environments. But it's. But when you actually look at the habitat, especially for wild better splendens, yes, they've got this adaptation, but there's not actually that many plants there. It is more maybe that new, the actual nutrients, once it becomes accessible, it 
goes fast downstream. They do look quite dark habitat, so plants aren't gonna, and dark because it's encroached by trees and emergent vegetation isn't gonna be able to grow beyond those trees. So it is a lot more complex. But I'd assume maybe these waters could be mesotrophic. Um, but it does show maybe how uncommon plants are in freshwater. So oligotrophic, and although I've been talking about nutrients and how much bacteria and algae it grows, and I'm talking about maybe more comparison of these environments. And just because there's less algal growth, less microbial growth, it doesn't mean plants can't grow, and it also doesn't mean that there isn't um, any of these microbes. It does limit the amount of growth, but that doesn't mean there isn't any. And it will limit the actual taxa that will grow. So taxa um, or groups of algae, uh, microbes, plants, anything has that narrow range of habitats that it prefers, it's adapted to, it's evolved to. And the same, well, nutrients is a massive limiting factor. So it's quite good to, I think, recognise that yes, you will have that wide diversity of algae, microbes, even with low nutrients. But when you're giving high nutrients, you might also be encouraging certain ones that are a lot more vigorous to grow. If you think about maybe, um, I think it's good to compare it almost to gardens, if you're going to put a lot of nutrients in. And you're going to get a lot of vigorous plant growth, but it might not always be the plants you want. It might not provide the widest diversity of plants, because when you're looking at succession or like a woodland probably won't have, have as high nutrients as maybe somewhere um, to the middle of the range of succession of plant growth and habitats. And I think we have to recognise maybe that there's a lot more to it than just nutrients. Could it be that oxygen saturation, the CO2, the lights, what spectrum of lights, what tax are we growing? Are they in a habitat where they're going to grow best? And then with fish, I think it's important, but there's not as much research on it. Yes, there is a lot more to it. Um, many regions we collect our fish from in, fit into this category oligotrophic because nutrients such as nitrates and ozone phosphates contribute to conductivity and TDS. They are whole, the lower conductivity and TDS are hallmarks of an oligotrophic system, but this isn't always the fact or isn't often the fact. Maybe it, it depends on the system itself. But this low nutrients does sound familiar. Rainforests, due to their high biodiversity, tend to be oligotrophic themselves, and maybe this is part of why there is so much diversity, as I mentioned earlier. I have provided links of um, papers that we commonly get a lot of our aquarium fishes from um, to compare, well, to see their um, conductivity levels, but also regarding whether they're oligotrophic or not. Um, and while rivers are often oligotrophic low nutrients, it can, um, lakes can be a little bit maybe more diverse and it depends where you are in the lake, but it's maybe a little bit less, I wouldn't say they're eutrophic. Um, Lake Malawi, for example, is most often referred to as oligotrophic to mesotrophic, or Lake Windermere and um, in the Lake District is oligotrophic. And this is slightly related to source waters. And it's important to match these conditions, I think, for a variety of reasons. As a contributor to TDS and conductivity, given these fishes that have adapted for that range they have evolved in, it's a good argument to put forward. Um, simply though, a high, uh, high nutrients environment won't have a lower TDS or conductivity. While these values are somewhat vague, we are mostly talking about nitrogen and phosphorus um, and not um, simplistic at all. So that's I've written there. Um, so it is a little bit more complex and I think low nutrients, there's not actually, like, especially when it comes to fishes, a lot of people are feeding on the fact there's probably not, 
Well, there isn't that much research, I think, regarding the fishes themselves in the context of an aquarium, opposed to in the context of an ecosystem where it affects the whole environment. And that's where it gets a bit more fuzzy, especially in terms of um, nitrogen and phosphorus, or nitrates and, uh, what's it, uh, phosphates. But I do think it's a good idea to think about how you're going to match the natural environment. And these nutrient levels could also, because they're affecting the rest of the, the actual microbes in the tank, how are they, those microbes actually going to affect the nitrifying bacteria and how do they interact with each other? So it's not, it's not simplistic and I think a lot more thought needs to be done into it. And why did I think, well why is this maybe important to me? So my tanks have never really, well they haven't had algae in years and part of it I've always accounted to succession. Um, that these tanks are older systems um, comparatively to maybe a lot of people's tanks but also they are low nutrients I do 50% twice a week which isn't that many actually compared to maybe a lot of discus tanks um, but there is maybe they are a lot more nutrient um, but they have next to no um, detectable nitrates I've never tested phosphates never needed to I still get plant growth of that <laughs> Um, but it's not plants that aren't adapted for the environment entire, uh, well, env adapted for that aquatic environment, even though Anubis isn't. I've got Maramo here, which is slow growing. But I don't get really high um, levels of algae and microbes. And I've also noticed that when there is some sort of change, so maybe when I'm switching uh, filters, um, messing with the media, I do get a lot of different types of um, organisms. So I might get a lot of filter feeders, particularly when I'm messing with the filters because there's a lot more sediment load. And messing with the nutrients obviously will affect these microbes, the... Um, and then it stabilizes a little bit more. Does this affect the fish? It's really difficult to say, um, but it is worth considering thinking about. And also algae cleaning, I think a lot of people hate, um, but obviously I've, it's something I've considered um, or thought about for a while. So a lot of people might argue I guess about whether their water bodies have a lot more nutrients or actually being deceived by the water bodies they're looking at and maybe thinking that this is natural when it's not. So a lot of people will see, particularly these days, a lot of sediment in natural waterways and there is a lot of fresh water is now polluted and that doesn't mean it's just liquid pollution it can be actual physical pollution in the forms of animal feces um, for maybe fertilizing crops or maybe it's um, heavy rain has forced it into the waterways and also just even a bit well the sewage as well but also liquid um, where um, the liquids will encourage um, or liquid waste is that the right? Um, also aquaculture will encourage, well it's increasing the nutrient levels. So what we see is it natural is mostly going to be these days, maybe not. A lot of waterways they might look teeming with life but the life is actually struggling because a lot of life is not evolved for that sort of high nutrients eutrophic environment or even mesotrophic if it's not naturally. And you can look at the actual invertebrates present and one of the main one, caddis fly, um, even uh, chromatids need a lot of oxygen and because of those algae that are being encouraged by the high nutrients, they're not there. We don't have those predictors in the aquariums to know about, especially oxygen saturation. Apart from the fish, but a lot of it's really difficult when it comes to fish and knowing entirely about oxygen saturation. There is also the influence of dams, weirs, um, the how humans have 
managed rivers that has changed flow regimes and also um, the amount of nutrients that is in the water and where it's being deposited for example above the dam there might be a lot more nutrients compared to where the dam is and this is affecting the organisms themselves and it's not just these um, microorganisms or invertebrates it does affect the fish later on but when we think of this is a natural environment we want to replicate for our fish is it actually natural and or is it anthropogenic due to pollution, invasive species, carp are massive for dislodging nutrients, they will um, make a water body a lot more silty um, or just a lot more turbid even. But a lot of waterways that were once these sort of high, what I think of as a high flow, low nutrients, no sediment, because of the high levels of pollution they are now looking like they've got a, they should have that loads of silt they shouldn't have that amount of silt and this is due to the human interaction with fresh water and it's affecting everything and our drinking water so if you want to replicate a natural environment it's getting really difficult and especially looking at your backyard maybe think about environments that maybe are less touched but the whole of the world has been anthrop um, what was it? Is anthropogenic to a degree. Humans have been interacting even with the most remote environments. There's nowhere that is not touched by humans. So consider that, that when you're thinking about creating your fish tank and how you want to replicate nature in the tank. Because a lot of people maybe are a bit deceived by what they see outside. And that might also be the removal of certain things that create habitats, um, the, how people damage banks, um, remove, uh, remove things such as, uh, what's it, like big tr fallen trees, fallen logs, um, or maybe just placing things that aren't meant to be there. There's a lot more to freshwater and a lot of people maybe generalise it too much. It shouldn't be generalised. It's a very complex set of many different ecosystems that are very misunderstood. There's not even any real degrees in just freshwater biology as far as I know. So not many, a lot of people are aware of the marine environment but they're not aware of freshwater. Anyway. I'm going to end this now. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe and goodbye.